Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. All right, welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Today we are joined by Bert Burns. Bert and I raced wheelchairs together. He has done 87 marathons. Quadriplegic, Bert, show him your hands a little bit. I remember the calluses that you used to have. I don't know. If, are oh, they, are the they calluses st- are kind of gone. I still got the quad paws. So, yeah, the calluses might be gone. You are you uh, are you living a little softer, more comfortable life? Getting those getting those hands a little smoother. Is that what's going on? That's helped a little bit. I uh, I I still push my chair, but I use a handergometer usually to work out in, and and I eat, and now I even have a um, a little battery, little smart drive on the back of my wheelchair every once in a while, to where I even just kind of tap my wrist and it it it. it propels me i'm still in a manual chair but i got a smart drive that i use about half the time to take me around town so well, that makes you a little I'm smart i'm getting the yeah, it makes me smarter i'm getting a little lazier but i'm smarter <laughs> well, Bert, well thanks thanks for joining us this is this is a pleasure to talk to you these guys are in for a pleasure because you are a consummate storyteller now four four paralympic games right 92 90 uh 96 in atlanta uh, 2000 yeah. in Sydney, and then and then finished like me in Athens in 2004. And you finished with the marathon in Athens. My last was, race, my last race I ever did was a marathon in Athens. Yes. How cool was that? Because that's where I mean, like I figured I was finishing sort of in the symmetry, right? It had been seven games for me, and I finished mm-hmm. where the Olympics started. You know, yeah, and, and and so that's kind of cool because the Paralympic ideal is very similar to the Olympic ideal, and but you did the marathon. I mean, it wasn't the same marathon course that created the marathon, but it was the same finishing point, right? Yeah, it was a similar course. It was just fortunately paved now, and it made it a little easier to push. But yeah, we finished in the same uh, the same original Olympic Stadium, and. It felt great to, to know that you're doing a very the very similar course and and finishing the same stadium. And I mean, the, the stadium still had the old concrete, uh, the concrete or, or rock seats, and um, it was just amazing, um, an, an amazing day. It wasn't my best marathon ever, but I, I still uh, I did well, and uh, I was just happy to be out there. And that was my my last real competitive race I, I uh, ever did in my racing chair. So you're saying original, I was actually talking about the original, the warrior who ran in full armor and everything that, that created <laughs> the idea exactly. of, okay. of the okay. marathon. But you're talking about 1896. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Of the modern, the modern Olympics, right? Modern Olympics. That's, yes. where, that's where they yeah. replicated that, that run. Exactly the same the same same course that he did in eighteen ninety six exactly, so it was it was it was it was, uh, it was awesome. It was a great experience and a, a great way to finish it off. Finish off my uh, my racing career. Did you have yeah. at that point you knew you were you knew that was the end of your career. You were still racing in that marathon, but did you have those kind of moments where you're reflecting on your career? You're reflecting on the significance of the games all of those things as you're going through or was it specifically you were you were there in the competition and staying focused uh, i was pretty much there in the competition staying focused but but after that marathon was over and um you know thinking back on it thinking back over you know the four paralympics i'd been in and uh that this was really it um you know then's when it kind of got kind of got a little emotional and thinking you know, I mean, I started racing back in, I got injured in 82 and I started racing. Uh, my first race was in, in, I injured in January of 82. I did my first 5K road race in September of 82. And I did it in my everyday chair. And back then, everyday chairs weren't like they are now. They weren't, you know, lightweight chairs. I had a 65 pound chair with wheelie bars and armrests and swing weight foot rests. And it weighed about 65 pounds. And, um, it was a 5K road race, and I got past you know, about 600 people, about 10 or 15 wheelchairs, 
and I got past by every little kid and every old lady and came in dead last, but I finished it. And so, you know, from, from that time, thinking about that first race and then finishing the, the like the ultimate marathon ever, it was kind of a, a neat experience to go from one, I guess, one extreme to the, to the other. Well, it even started back earlier than that, right? Where you had the, the from the house to the stop sign. Yeah, my my first when I got I got discharged in in June of '82. So I got injured in January. I got discharged in June, and I'm my I'm got dis- I wasn't totally independent yet. So I got discharged at my parents' house. They lived the third house on the street, and I wanted to get exercise. So I went out on the on the on the road. And I pushed down to the stop sign. And I couldn't get back. My brother had helped me back. Next night, I pushed the stop sign. Third, got about halfway back. The third night, stop sign, all the way back. Yes. And, you know, that was like my first, I don't know, I, I, I call my life a whole, a whole bunch of baby steps. And that was my, my first accomplished baby step. And, you know, before the end of the, in, in two or three weeks, I was pushing, you know, around our neighborhood block and, and it was taking me a long time, but I was doing it. And so that's kind of how I look at just my life. In, you know, right first, my whole paralyzed life was a, just a, a series of baby steps. And now, were you an athlete before your accident? I was. I was a, I was a, um, I was a decent athlete. I mean, I played in high school, you know, from six, six years old through high school, I played baseball and football. And then uh, in college, I wasn't good enough to play college ball or anything, but I played intramurals and stuff. And so I was, you know, kind of a weekend athlete, weekend warrior. But um, once I – and I always felt like if I would have either – like say uh, the baseball and football, if I would have focused on one of those, either focused on baseball, all my effort, or focused on football, all my effort, I might could have gone and played a, a D3 school or something. But uh, I didn't. And so once I got paralyzed – I kind of felt like, and my recreation therapist introduced me to wheelchair racing and, you know, wheelchair racing kind of got oxymoron to me because uh, my, my wheelchair, I could, I could push it maybe, you know, uh, two miles an hour down the, the tiled hallway. And so uh, I wasn't going very fast. So it's going to take a long time to do a race. But um, once I got into wheelchair racing, it kind of gave me a, another opportunity to excel in the sport. And so that's why I uh, kind of took it and, and, and ran with it, took it and, and, and pushed with it, whatever you want to call it, and tried to get better and better at it. And, uh, you know, you so said, I think it's okay. You said that that therapist was really, really influential, right? And, and it was, was sure. that progressive at the time? I mean, this is mid eighties. And did she bring in some, some athletes as well? She did. She brought in a, a, a local athlete. It was about uh, wheelchair racing had just just kind of gotten gotten started. Uh, this was in '82, and there was a, there was a few a few companies that made made racing chairs. And there was one over in in um, Tampa area named Handcrafted Metals, and uh, George Murray was a part of it. And and um, uh, I've got the uh, his business partner's name, but um, they they owned it. And they made racing chairs, but they were about sixteen hundred dollars, and I was about two thousand short. So I um, I couldn't afford a racing chair yet. So uh, she brought in a guy from the, from the community, got him Randy Knoll. I have no idea where Randy Knoll is nowadays, but Randy came in and brought a racing chair, and they actually put me in the racing chair. He picked me up and put me in there and strapped my legs down. And, and we had real short racing chairs back then. Uh, the the rules been real real tiny, and uh. I pushed down the hallway and instead of going two miles an hour, now I'm going like three or four miles an hour. I'm like, yeah, I just doubled my speed, man. I like this. And so I thought, you know, with a little bit of training, I, 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 could, I might can get decent at this stuff. And so, um, yeah, that's when I decided I, that I wanted to eventually get a racing chair. And it was, it was, it was I have a, a cool story. I'll tell you a little about how I got my first racing chair. It was kind of a neat experience. So, that first 5k you did i yep. just want to create a little bit of a little bit of perspective in terms of in terms of time how long did that 5k take you that first one that you did in your stainless steel 65 pound chair 
An hour and six minutes, Chris. <laughs> hour and six minutes. My uh, my whole fraternity walked the marathon with me. I uh, walked the, the the 5K with me as I as I did my hour and six minute 5K, 3.1 mile, <laughs> 20 <laughs> minutes a mile. <laughs> 20 minutes a mile. And it was a flat, wow. it was a perfectly flat course right there at, at UCF in Orlando. And uh, but I didn't give up. I finished it, and that was the next, you know, next step in all my baby steps. And so that was that was a little bit below three miles an hour then. Yes, a little bit below three miles. Yes, I, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, it was. <laughs> What was the fastest 5K that you that you did eventually? My fastest 5K eventually was a, a 12 minutes and 10 seconds. 12 so, minutes and 10 <laughs> uh, It was on the track, under four minute miles. So yeah, that was a little over, I, I averaged like 15.2 miles an hour in that one. So from two and change, you know, high two to 15.2 miles an hour. So that's that's where we're going to end up. You know, yes. <laughs> wow. Now, did did having having racing did did that having the racing in the hospital did that make the transition easier to you? Is mentally, emotionally, did you have something to look forward to? Yeah, it, it helped in in a, in a whole bunch of ways, Chris. Um, obviously, it helped me physically because it got me. You know, I'm getting out and got me stronger. Got my my cardio better, it got me, so I'm getting stronger, it makes transfers easier. Uh, it makes, you know, loading my wheelchair in a car easier. It makes getting dressed easier. It makes transferring, you know, in and out of the tub easier. You know, everything. Um, the stronger I got, and the, the better shape I got in made life easier. And then emotionally, um, emotionally, mentally, you know, every every 10K, every 5K and 10K I did, I, I got a little bit better on each one of them. You know, I would do this, you know, I, I, when I finished the hour and five minutes, that first 5K, I knew at least this could be the worst I'll ever do. You know, only, it only gets better from here. And they did. You know, I, I get to where I was doing, you know, I was still just kind of a weekend warrior. I wasn't really training. But but doing – I train a couple days a week sometimes. But um, if I'd go out and do a race, then I got to where I was doing, you know, the 5K races and, you know, 25 minutes or you know 24 minutes some eight minute miles eight yeah eight, eight minute miles which is which is okay when, when i eventually got a racing chair um that means you're in with the run with a fair amount of runners yeah and with a lot of right. runners and yeah, yeah and runners. In, uh, when i was down in um in orlando they had a uh there was a there's a company there called track shack it was a uh shoe a shoe company the a shoe store and they had a track shack grand prix series and they had about uh, 15 races that were on the track track series and there was you know five or six five k's you know 10 10 k's and then one half marathon and so i did that whole series every year while i was down there and and so i could you know it's hard to compare one 10k to another 10k because you know the, the roads are different and your courses are different but i could compare my 10k this year to my 10k last year and say you know this 10k it took me it took me 46 minutes this year. Well, last year it took me 53 minutes. So I'm getting better. Next year it took me 42 minutes. So each year I get a little better and better. And then uh, when I when I finally got better was once I got out of school and I moved up to Atlanta and I, I started training with a team. When I started training with a team, that make, that makes a big difference. And you know, you're going out there three or four nights a week training and you come, you know, you, you have somebody to train with and there's a couple of quads in team, a couple of slow paras. So I'm trying to draft off the paras and keep up with them and trying to outrun the other quads. And so, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was, and it made it fun. When you were, let's just take a couple of steps back first. When you were first okay. in the hospital and, yep. and they told you that you were quadriplegic, what was your, what was your thought? I mean, cause you're talking about, you got stronger and stronger, made transfers easier, made getting in out of car easier, all of these things. But initially, did you think I'm not going to be able to do any of this? I mean, that's the assumption, right? Because yeah. you don't—you probably didn't know anybody who was a quadriplegic. 
I didn't. I didn't know anybody with a spinal cord injury. I didn't know any, any quads or paras or anything. And they told me I'm, I'm quadriplegic. Um, and when people think of quadriplegics, they think just your average person here is quadriplegic. You think of like a Christopher Reeve. You think you're paralyzed from neck down. When people see me move my arms, they don't they don't think you're a quad. But I always have to explain to them there's you know seven vertebrae and I was very fortunate. I broke the, the two lowest vertebrae, six and seven. So even though I don't have full hand function, I got good arm, good arm, arm function. And I did not write it first. I remember when I was first um, going through rehab, there was a little, they had a little board that had a little bit of a slant to it. And I had to try to push this one pound weight up this board with my arms. And I couldn't, you know, I might get it up one time or something, a one pound weight. And I'd gone from, like I said, I was in college playing your murals and you know, I was a pretty athletic guy and in decent shape to, to starting from ground zero. And uh, so, yeah, it, um, it's a, it, you had to just start all over again and your two choices are give up or start over. And I decided not to give up. Well, but, but also the thought is that this might be it too, right? Like this might yeah. be, the, the strongest you might get is maybe getting that one pound bait, uh, one pound weight up the board one time, you know, like mm -hmm. that might be as good as it gets. And, and that's the hard part in the beginning, isn't it? That you think, I can't imagine what's going to be, what, what's, what's possible. So how did you, how did you find the way to go from that difficult space to to you know, realizing realizing some some results exactly. Well, when I was in rehab, um, unfortunately, rehab stints now are so short. Insurance doesn't pay for rehab. Now. People they, they get paralyzed and they're out in thirty days, and they haven't, they have not even accepted the fact they're paralyzed. Because everybody you know everybody thinks you get paralyzed and you, you broke your back, you broke your neck, and you you it, it'll heal like your other bone has, and and you know, you'll start walking again. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, some people do, and and I've never give up the hope for anybody. But uh, I always tip people I'm talking to. I say, well, until you start walking again, you know, if you do, until you start walking again, just be the best you can in a wheelchair. And so, after therapy every night, our our um, rehab center had it was like a big square and um, a big square hallway. And so after I do therapy. I push around that that square like 10 times forwards, and I go 10 times backwards. Work my triceps one direction, my biceps the other direction. And and the rest of the people that did therapy with me all, all day, the quads and pairs, are out on the back porch, you know, smoking cigarettes, hanging out, and they're there laughing. Look at that Burns kid going about going over there in circles, you know. And um, but I wanted and they got easier and easier and got stronger and stronger. And so I was doing that when I was in when I was in rehab because I remember when my the first, uh, one of the first weeks you're, you're, you get out of intensive care, you get over to rehab and they, they bring you in, they bring you with your physical therapist, your occupational therapist, your rec therapist, your doctor, your main, uh, your main nurse. They show you a, a spinal, spinal column. They tell you what you broke and, and, um, you know, where are you going to be in life? And, uh, they, you know, my doctor said that, you know, I, I asked him, you know, how long do you think I'll live? And he goes, well, if you make it to 50, you'll be doing okay. And uh, that was 20 and, years old. Uh, thanks a lot. And, um, and, and hold on now. How old are you now? I'm 59. And I'm okay. doing just fine. Thank you. And <laughs> I, 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 thought, I think that doctor's passed away now. So I, uh, uh, I outlived him. And uh, I asked him if I'd ever had kids. He said, nope, you'll never have children. I said, okay, okay, doc. Thank you. But back at that time, you know, uh, most quads and parents didn't have kids back in 82. But that, that's another story. But um, so, you know, I, I was always the type of person to want to like prove people wrong. And um, they said I couldn't do the best way to get me to do something is tell me I can't say, no, nah, you'll, you'll never be able to do that. And, you know, just quads don't do that. Well, parents do, but quads don't. Like my physical therapist, they're closer than the end of my stay. They wanted to get me a, they wanted me to be discharged in a power wheelchair. I said, I don't want a power wheelchair. Why do I need a power wheelchair? So well, you're a quad. I said, well, I'm pushing this chair fine. Thank you. I don't want a power chair. And sure, would it have been easier? Yeah. But I got the, 
in the manual chair and, and, you know, the chairs got lighter and lighter and I got stronger and stronger and I was able to push a manual chair my whole life. And I said, I still push it. Now a little, a little bit of help the smart driver once in a while, but, but uh, I can, exactly. I'm, I'm saving my, I, I have plenty of miles on my shoulders already. So I, I'm going to save them for the rest of my life for sure. So the motivation was, was that they told you that you couldn't do it. And you said I, that, that you were, I'm assuming there, there was something else for you as well. It wasn't just proving them wrong though. That motivated you to do those laps forwards and backwards. Yeah. I, I want and I, I want, I didn't want to just prove to them. I want to prove to them. I'm also going to prove to myself. Um, myself, I, 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 I knew I'd never given up on, on any thing before in my life. I'd never given up any kind of sport I'd done. It, it, and it, school, sports, whatever. I always, you know, I kind of finished where I started. And um, it was kind of the same way. I, I knew I had a lot of things I needed to do to get to where I wanted to be. And I wanted, you know, one of my main goals to be independent. And I wasn't independent yet. I, had, you know, when I got discharged, I, was, I knew I was moving home to my parents' house. And I'm you know, 20 years old. I've been living in an apartment for, for three years, going to college and going back to my parents' house. What what I wanted, and it sure what 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 they wanted either. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, twenty year old Bert was. I, I was probably a little bit of a pain to my my, my folks. Uh, I think I know I was, and um, and so I, I know I wanted to be independent, and to get independent, I had to get stronger, and I had to get, I had to get to rock and do everything. I remember my first, I remember my first time when I moved away from their house. And uh, moved up to, um, I, I had done my first two years at UCF in Orlando. My next two years, I was up at the University of Florida. And um, the first night in my apartment, uh, I was still getting dressed in bed. So I took a shower, laid clothes by the, by, the, by the bed for the next morning. So when I got the, when I woke up the next morning, I could get dressed. And I uh, laid everything out, pulled the covers up and turned over. And the overhead light was still on. And everything. And, you know, if I was at the house, I'd yell for my brother, yell for mom, dad, they'd come cut off the light. No, me, I had to get up. I was still using a sliding board. I had to get up, use a sliding board. And, and you know, it sounded like easy to get up and cut off the light and get back in bed. It took me about 20 minutes to finally get up, get over there, get up to the light, turn off, get back in bed, get everything all situated, a you know, bed bag, all kinds of stuff. And, but I never turned that light, I never left that light on again. You know, you, you learn. Reminder. Yeah, it's a good reminder. You never you learn things, and so um, that was that was some. Uh, there's a lot of learning, a lot of learning experiences on the way for all of us, for sure. How about the first time you fell out of your chair? <laughs> um, I remember when I, I remember the first time I really remember it. Um, like I say, I was with my parents, and uh, my mom. I wasn't driving yet. But I started back to school and my first day back to UCF, mom took me to school and dropped me off. I'm like, mom, you know, I will make a big deal of it. Let me out and drive away, please. Um, and she started driving away and I pushed off and I pushed up this ramp and I, I'd gotten rid of my wheelie bars. And I'm not wearing these, I'm not using these silly wheelie bars. And I pushed up this ramp and I didn't lean forward at all or whatever I should have done. So I'm leaning back in the chair, pushed up this ramp, flipped over. Busted my head, right? You know, popped the. I didn't. I don't. I don't know. I don't think like I bled or anything, but, but uh, I just popped my head on the asphalt, and did it hurt? Yeah, but it hurt. It was more embarrassing than anything else. You know, twenty, you know, college kids came running and gave me a hand, and my mom was freaking out, and you know, she saw the rearview mirror, she saw them She gets out of the car, comes running over there, I'm like, mom, go away, you know, and uh. So yeah, that was a, that was the first time I remember falling out, and uh, it hurt my ego more than it hurt my head. <laughs> and luckily, you had all these people around who who can put you in the chair, because then yes. that's the other dilemma as well. You've got the embarrassment of falling, and then you've got yeah. to on the ground back into your chair. Well, another time I fell, Chris, I was um I was in a mall one time about about twenty five years ago, I guess, and um. I was, there was probably 40 strollers waiting in the elevator. So I went over into the escalator. The escalators, 
right. for, for guys in chairs are, are pretty easy for pairs and, and quads if you, if you can hold on well. And um, so I rolled it up on the escalator. And it's kind of funny, the escalator be packed. Once you roll a wheelchair on the escalator, nobody gets on behind you for a long time. They wait way back there. But uh, so I get to the top of the escalator where the escalator steps are folding down into the, into the little metal thing. Uh, the metal piece was sticking up a little bit. I had roller blade wheels in my front, and the roller blades just stopped right there. I had my hand on the rails, and so it pulls me right out of the chair, and I, I fall out of the chair, but I, I pull my chair over, and I'm getting situated because now, you know, when I f first fell, was I needed all the help getting up. Now I can get back in my chair on my own. It takes a, a, a few minutes, but I, I can get back on my own. And so I can get my chair situated, and you know, one or two people kind of watching, making sure I'm okay. And some lady from like 50 feet away started screaming, "Call 911! Call 911!" I'm like, "Shut up! Shut up!" And um, and um, you know, by that time, you know, 30 people crowded around me, and everybody's grabbing a limb, an arm, a leg, and everything. I feel like a Three Stooges routine. And they put me back in the chair. Finally, I got out of that mall. I don't think I'm back to that mall for like three or four years. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I was not going to be seen by anybody that saw me that day. Oh, that's awesome. Now, you did say that there's a story on how you got your first racing wheelchair. Because we've talked a little bit about racing, but we haven't we haven't gotten you in your first racing wheelchair. How did that work? Well, um, I had... Uh, when I was in college, when I was at UCF, um, before I was paralyzed, I was a waiter and a bartender at a restaurant called Steak and Ale. It was a used to be an old, you know, a steak restaurant. And um, I bartended three nights a week there and waited tables three nights. And when I bartended three nights a week, you have your same regulars every night. They're there. You know, there, there are some people that come every night and drink a whole bottle of scotch every night. And there's a guy named John Schofield. And John was a, a businessman, owned his own, owned his, he owned his own company. And um, and John drank a bottle of Dewar's a night. And he'd walk out of there, just it sounded and talked like he never drank a bit of it. But he, you know, he was he was definitely an alcoholic, but he was a, a great man, very nice guy. And um, after I did that, after I did that first race, um, the race out at UCF, where I came in an hour and five minutes dead last, um, that night, that Saturday night, I went to Steak and Ale. And um, Steak and Ale, I never had to pay for a meal ever again. The managers were so great to me. And, and uh, so I went in there, had dinner, and I'm, I'm telling everybody, I'm sitting kind of in the bar area waiting on the table, and I'm telling all my regulars that I didn't race today. And they said, well, how'd you do? Well, I came in came in dead last. And, uh, and, and you know, John said, I told him about the racing chairs, and John chimed in and said, why don't you buy a racing chair? And that's when I so that quote I said to you a while ago, I said, well, John, they're, they're called $1,600 and about 2000 short. And he kind of laughed a little bit and then he, he kind of kept listening. He goes, well, would you use race chair if you had it? And I said, oh, yes, sir, I would. He goes, well, go ahead and buy one. I said, no, John, I, I, I can't afford it yet. He goes, no, you, you just order it. I'll pay for it. I said, John, they're, they're $1,600. He goes, that's okay. I, I'll, I'll pay for it. So one of my bar regulars, from steak and ale bought my first racing chair for me and uh so i got out of money ordered a chair and john paid for it and that's how i got my first chair wow now did he did he ever come and watch you race um i don't think he ever came and watched me no but i i i would call him after i do races because i was still living there in orlando for a while and um tell him how i did and then after my first paralympics my first paralympics when i got a a gold medal in 92, um, I sent him a big long letter and a picture of me up on the medal stand and just thanked him and said, it all started with you, John. I couldn't have done it without you. And um, you know, there's a whole bunch of people along the way that we all know there's a bunch of people along the way that sure. that we did all that helped us in different different times and different times of our lives that we couldn't have gotten to where we are now without without that that help. And but John was a was a big help for me. But that first step is the hardest step, right? I mean, like yeah. the, the therapist who, who got you going and introduced you to some racers, John helping you get your first racer. How much faster was it once you got into your own racing chair? Oh, it was a lot faster. Um, you know, like I say, I, I did that five, first 5K an hour in five minutes. And 
So my, my order the race chair. So I got it about two months later and, you know, right away, only two months later, I could do a, a 5k in about, you know, 45 minutes. So, you know, 15 minute miles, still it's a long time, but you know, cut 20 minutes off my time. And uh, so that made a, a huge difference. And, uh, and then once I got used to the chair and got used to the stroke and used to tape, taping my gloves and a lot of kind of stuff, it got faster and faster. And I, I had, there's about 10 wheelchair athletes there in town that I kind of learned from, learned how to tape my gloves, learned how to, you know, change my hand rims if I'm going to be on a flat course or if I'm going to be on a hilly course or, you know, the different things we, we learn as racers along the way. And uh, so I was able to help uh, learn from their experiences for sure. Well, for you also, I mean, there's the racing part, but then there's sort of the community part in some ways. Like you were a business mm -hmm. major originally, right? And then right. became a rec therapist uh, mm -hmm. major so that yeah. you could go and, you know, I mean, like, why did, why did you make that decision? Well, like I said, I was, a, I was a business major when I was at UCF. And once I got paralyzed, that rec therapist, you know, like I said, I had a great PT, great OT. But the rec therapist that introduced me to, to Randy and introduced me to wheelchair racing kind of made the biggest impact on my life at that time. And so her name was Ann Tabor. And I, I just wanted to go and do what Ann did. And um, so I had to change schools, change majors. Um, I had to go from UCF up to, they, they didn't offer a therapeutic recreation uh, major. Closest place it did was University of Florida. So that's where I ended up going. And um, I went to University of Florida and got my degree in, in therapeutic recreation. And when I got discharged, my first job, I was very, very fortunate. My first job was at Shepherd, it was called Shepherd Spinal Center at the time, Shepherd Center now in Atlanta, which is one of the, the best spinal cord injury rehabilitation centers in the world. And, um, and my job title was sports and fitness specialist. So every day, all I did in the rec therapy department, they had eight therapists, they had four specialists, an outdoor specialist, a horticulture specialist, a cultural art specialist, and then a sports and fitness specialist. And it's so all I did five days a week, eight hours a day was teach wheelchair sports. And so I would teach, you know, I would teach racing and rugby and and um you know table tennis and you know from, from quads but if we wanted to go out and do like show basketball or show um some sports i could not do i would get some i had a lot of volunteers you know paraplegics and out in the community that were good at those kind of sports good at tennis or good at, at basketball they could come in and and show my my patient brand new patients show them that sports was, was an opportunity was an option and that, that life wasn't over like i say just do do things differently and you know you the basketball rules are the same basketball same same goal height you know you just got to dribble you know once you every two push pushes dribble yeah yeah exactly you know, dribble in the basketball in while you're pushing a wheelchair and um uh, and so in wheelchair tennis, you got two bounces, but the guy's real good. That second bounce will be back at the fence. You better get to it quickly. And um, so those kind of things I, I got to teach in um, some sports that, that I wasn't able to, to see here in Atlanta. I had videos of them doing, um, you know, doing snow skiing, doing, you know, whitewater rafting, doing different things like that, that uh, I would always, you know, uh, show videos on, on how to do it so so it was a it was a great job and I was there for for five years it was awesome was that when you started thinking about the Paralympics when you were at Shepherd or did that happen prior well it happened um yes about the same time because I like I say when I moved to Atlanta and I started working at Shepherd Shepherd also sponsored a a, a racing team what's your racing team so I wasn't just training by myself anymore. I got to go out and train the, the, the team. And I moved there in, in 88. And um, prior to that, uh, used to we, we compete locally in track events. And we could compete regionally. And you had to do qualifying times regionally. You could compete, compete nationally. And if you were real good at national games, you got picked for international teams. And uh, I was never – Good enough for international team of four, but I did my first nationals in 1985 in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, you know there was a ton of people out there running, 
you know, quarterfinals and semifinals and finals and, and, um, I'm getting spanked on all of them, but hey, I'm 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 learning some things all, all along the way. Uh, you got to learn from winning and learning. You learn you learn a lot more from losing sometimes, and uh, and so um, when I got to Shepherd in '89 and started training the team, now I'm actually training three or four nights a week with a about three nights a week with a team, and I had a set of rollers and started training three nights a week on my own also. So I'm I'm training six nights a week now, and so I got I got faster. And so, I mean, I went to 1990 nationals and did well at the national games and got picked for my first international team in 1990. I got to go to um, um, the Netherlands and and over in Austin and um, competed over there. And then once I, I did okay there, my goal really was to make the 92 Paralympic team. So I came home and just doubled up on, on, on training hard and. Fortunately, fortunately made the team. Sounds like in some ways that your experience with track was similar to mine. How was, how was the way that you saw racing on the track differently than racing on the road? I'll see if we, if we share the same experience here. Um, racing on track for me, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy. Uh, even when I'm, when I'm in great shape, I'm, I'm 185. I'm six one. I'm a right. big bone guy. And when I'm in, uh, even when I'm nice and skinny, I'm, one, I'm, you know, 185, 190 is a great race weight for me. So the track, when I got in great shape, I could push around a track forever and keep it about, once I got real good, I keep it about 13, 14 miles an hour for two hours. But um, I didn't like hills. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you're big and heavy, going downhill is great. But you don't make up near as much hill going downhill as you lose going uphill. I had some little little racers like a uh, Clayton Garen, Ian Rice, you know, which all weighed 120 pounds. Sure, I'd smoke them down the hill, but they, yeah, I'm, I'm slowing down uphill like like Peachtree, for example, up the, the the main hill there. I'm down to three or four miles an hour, and they're they're smoking by me at eight miles an hour, you know, for for quads and you know pairs that at times are very. Um, I'm sure very comparative, not, not at the same time, not at the same times, but I'm sure that's really the hill. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And um, those hill climbers are could 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 could, could get me. Uh, so I kind of like the flat courses, and that's why I like to track a lot because it was it was flat, and I just had to just just you know hit my compensator once and go around the curve, and hit my compensator again, and going going straight again. So I only missed a you know half a stroke each time. And then on the um, the road races, I love the flat the flat road races. So if I have a good flat course, like in the Netherlands, I did pretty well in that marathon there because it was good and flat. And um, so that's how I usually did did better on on the flat races. My first nationals was ninety two, so it was when you were qualifying for Barcelona, and it was the first time I'd seen all the big guys on the track because right. everybody was there trying to qualify it was the nationals were also the Paralympic qualifier right and our Paralympic trials and so I got to see all these just exciting races and I thought this is really cool yeah because you know, coming around the last 200 meters and somebody's trying to pass somebody else and there are three or four guys or six or eight guys all going for the finish line at the same time and I thought this is awesome it looks great whereas when I was in a road race I might see them at the start and I might see them after we'd all finished, but I didn't see much of them in between. During so the race, right. Oh, that's kind of fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even the track even got lapped, it was still fun to watch them. <laughs> yeah, I nice. doubt you ever got lapped much, but, uh, but uh, you know, my, my first few years, I got, I got lapped a couple of times every once in a while. <laughs> so you made it to Barcelona what I what did. events did you run in Barcelona? And was Barcelona your favorite? Um, Barcelona is my favorite, probably because it was my first. And I had a um, I did the fifteen hundred meter, the five thousand meter, the marathon, and then I did a four by four hundred meter relay. And four by four hundred meter relay, I had three real fast guys with me, and um, we actually won the race, got gold medal. We set a world record, and um, I'm up with the medal stand, Chris, and they're they're playing the they're playing the national anthem, raise the American flag, putting the gold medal over my neck, 
and I'm just sitting there crying, man. I had tears running out down my eyes. And I was up there for maybe three minutes, but right in front of my, it was like a, a movie screen going in front of my eyes the whole time I was there. It was, I remember going to that melt, I remember going to that stop sign the first time, not getting back. I remember that first 5K, it took me an hour and five minutes. I remember those you know, first bunch of races where I'm doing, you know, 50, 48, 50 minute 10Ks. Um, I, I remember all that. It was like a video just going right, right through my eyes. And all of a sudden, I got injured in 82, now it's 92. 10 years later, they said I should have been in a power chair. And I'm up here getting a gold medal in Barcelona, Spain. That's pretty cool. It's really cool. So that was kind of why it was my favorite. I would imagine, and probably not what you could have imagined when yeah, you were I, lying I, there in a hospital bed. No, yeah, when I'm lying there in a hospital bed with a halo on, staring at the ceiling, and um, with a trach, and you know, getting suctioned every half, every every hour, and thinking, am I even going to live? And now all of a sudden, I'm in the Paralympics in Barcelona. It was pretty cool. When did you do your first marathon? Because marathon's got to be a daunting thought. When you when you started at a, an hour, five minute, 5K, but, and granted yeah. you got faster, but 42K My, for a marathon, yeah. that's a lot more Ks. whole bunch of Ks. My first marathon was a was Detroit Marathon in 1985. And again, it took me a, a, a long time. It took me, uh, I was three hours and 45 minutes. Did and, you take um, the, the tunnel underneath, underneath the river then? Yes, we did. We started in, we started over in Windsor and yep. it was beautiful. The, the first, first four or five miles was in Windsor. And it was, I swear, it was like, it was beautiful blue sky. It was crisp and it was in October and the roads were all perfect. And you go through the tunnel and you start coming out, of, you know, coming down the tunnel, you're, you're, you're hauling butt. You come out of the tunnel, and it's like taking you forever to get out of the tunnel. And the tunnel kind of curves. You think because that's a top. big climb coming yes. out of the out of the and, tunnel. And, and, and it, it starts curving left, and you think you you think you're almost top, but it keeps curving, and you're not there. You know, and it keeps curving, you're not there. Like where the, where's the top of this thing? And um, uh, and I come out of the tunnel in Detroit, and it's like hazy gray skies and potholes everywhere i'm like man i just went from from from, from an awesome place to 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 a third world country here it kind of felt like and um you know, yet you you homeless people chasing you so you, it makes you go fast and um but um doing that first 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 marathon i say just finishing it in, in three hours and 45 minutes was again that was i knew my first marathon had I, had I trained for a marathon? Not, not enough, <laughs> obviously. And uh, about the most I'd pushed prior to that was like 15 miles. And that had worn me out. So I pushed that marathon. It was, it was, it was tough. But again, I knew that marathon, I knew that it always get, it's only going to get better each one I do. And Did you uh, know the time, do you remember the time of the winning, winning quad in that marathon? I do not. Uh, the winning quad probably at that time was probably about a two and a half hours, uh, I would think, back then in 85. Uh, yeah. And um, so you were like but, 50% behind. Yeah, behind them. Yeah. I, I, there were some people, there were a few people behind me. That was good. I, right. wasn't, I wasn't dead last this time. But um, and there's a lot of runners behind me, and there's a few wheelchairs behind me too. So that was kind of good. And so it, it encouraged me to go home and start training for a marathon. And like I say, when I was on the flat, on the flats, I really felt good there on the flats. So, um, you know, I felt like, okay, I need to do flat marathons, which I, I love Chicago marathon for that reason. Chicago is a pretty flat marathon. I thought LA would be a flat marathon. LA is not a flat marathon. LA, there, there was two hills in, in LA. One I had to traverse to go up LA marathon. I wanted to actually turn around and go backwards. I had to pull myself up the hill. So LA was not like I thought it would be just from thinking I like Southern California, it's flat. No, not at You're all. On the beach, everything's good. It's gotta be uh, yeah, flat. It's been no, flat. LA. Yeah. Those were those were two of the steepest hills that I've ever encountered in a marathon, I think. Yeah. In LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you, same, same two hills. 
that I'm talking about. At least you were able to go straight up, right? And traverse them, traverse one and backwards on one. But well, the first year I, I did it. LA, it, it was actually it was raining too. It uh -huh. was raining and it was cold, and I thought, well, you don't go to LA to be to be rained on. No, you, know, you go to you Detroit go to for that. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the marathon definitely. So, did you fall in love with the marathon when you I did. were in your marathon in, in Detroit? Yeah. Um, yes, I did. Just because, like, like I say, after I got out of the out of the tunnel, it was it was pretty much flat all the way through Detroit, and like I said, the roads weren't were the best, but you just dodged the potholes and and uh, I could get in a good rhythm. I was only going, you know, probably six seven miles an hour, but I was getting good rhythm and um, I could hold that to the finish. And so I knew I could get better at it. I knew that from doing that tunnel, I knew the hills weren't, weren't were not ever going to be my friend. And um, and I knew that flat courses would be. So I, I searched out the flat courses. You know, like Cleveland Marathon was a good marathon. You go out and back, and you know, there's one bridge, which you know is all it was. Everything else is flat. It was pretty good, pretty good road also. So uh, I tried picking out the, the flat stuff today. What, so you you like the flat marathons, but marathons part of the there's an experience part of it too, right? I mean, just oh yeah, I mean that's that's one of the good things about LA marathon. In LA, you go through all the different boroughs, and you can you can you can tell what area of town you're in from the smell of food. Like I'm going through an area of town that's most Hispanic, or I'm going through an area of town that's Italian, or I'm going through an area of town that is Chinese, or or whatever, because because you can smell the food, and also on the marathon courses, there's you know is is if you're doing a hill, or any, any race, any race, if you're doing a hill, there's always someone you think okay I'm slowing down, and then you know you know you know your numbers four sixteen, somebody starts yelling come on four sixteen you can do it, so you you like oh, oh man somebody's watching me I got to pick it up, and so it does give you you know it gives you extra incentive to, to to keep going, and on the marathon. And, you know they're not lying the whole 26 miles of the course but but a good good bit of good portion of them there's always somebody out there cheering you on so it's it, it, it does make it a lot easier and uh it gives you an incentive to keep going for sure that's a, it, it cuts both ways i think because i remember that in boston where all our names were in the newspapers so so they knew your name by your number as you're going up heartbreak and you know come yeah. on chris i'm like I'm just dying here. I'm just dying. Like, let me die. Let me die quietly. I'm not, don't, I'm don't, not don't my, I don't want anybody to know my name when I die. <laughs> yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of races did have did have um your names or else they have a program with our our numbers and names. They all of a sudden you hear go let's go Bert let's go Bert. And so I would I would pick it up. I remember in, in Peachtree every year I did Peachtree 19 years in a row, and uh, Peachtree's a 10k road race here in Atlanta. And July um, fourth, yeah, July fourth, yes. And uh, one of my best friends that lives here in Atlanta came out every year. He was on the same corner, and um, uh, he always my 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 whole my official name's Herbert. And he's always called me Herbie, and um, there'd be just you know thousands of people lying the course. Everybody's cheering, and I, I go right around, right around this one corner every time I hear, "Come on, Herbie, pick it up, Herbie. You're you're running too slow, Herbie. Just come on." He started cheering for me. I, I always, I always know Steve was right there, and he, I, I'd pick it up. And uh, so it was, it was kind of a good motivator. That is fun. When did you get into the medical supply business? How did, how did that work? Well, um, I did, like I said, I did rec therapy for five years at Shepherd, and um, I left there in '91, and I was going to go back to school and get my MBA. And as I was applying for school, um, well, actually kind of before, I, before it all started, uh, I was getting, I was buying medical supplies from a company called DS Medical. And the guy that owned DS Medical, Dale Sims, called me and said, Bert, you know, you're getting supplies from us all the time. I'm looking to hire a sales rep. You ever, started, you ever thought about doing sales? I said, well, I've never really done sales, Dale, but I've always been told that you know, people always say you ought to be getting sales. You, you, you sell stuff. And uh, I've always worked with customers and stuff in restaurants growing up and stuff. I said, yeah, I'd, I'd like give it a try. And I did and was very forced, very successful with it. I, I kind of knew a lot of people from the racing community. I knew a lot of people from all my ex-patients from Shepherd. 
I knew, you know, I knew just knew a lot of people in, in chairs. And I was just selling urological supplies, selling, selling catheters, tons of catheters, and uh, did real well. And uh, I was there for about four years with him. And uh, one day he came and said there was, he, he, by that time, I was the first sales rep and we kind of worked way up and I was their sales manager, the national sales manager. We had two regional managers and each regional manager had eight sales reps under them. And everybody, everybody I hired was somebody in a wheelchair. I discriminated against walking people. Uh, because, you know, when, when, if you walk in a rehab center, you're going to get stopped by the gatekeeper all the time. But if you roll in a rehab center, a lot of times you just kind of roll right on by and get back in, in, in the area you're not really supposed to be in, but you get back and get away with it. So that's why I hired all, all folks in wheelchairs. And uh, they were all successful too, so it was good. So Dale called all middle management in his office one day and said he was selling the company. And I said, you know, I kind of raised my hand and said, what's going to happen to us? He goes, I don't know. They may keep it, they may not. I'm like, that wasn't a very good response. <laughs> and so uh, I left there that day. <laughs> And one of my regional managers and I started, we, we went to my house and started talk, talking about it and said, we can do this on our own. We don't need Dell Sims. We can start our own company. And so within six months later, uh, five months later, I started a company called Euromed. And um, and Dell Sims, actually the sale, the sale ended up falling through, so he didn't sell. So we started Euromed and, and uh, he lost a lot of his business to us over the, over the, next, over the next few years. So that's kind of uh, kind of stuck a knife in his back a little bit. That's okay. And um, but Euromed, we were very fortunate. Um, we we grew it, uh, kept it for eighteen years, and um, had about 100, 120 employees total, and about seven thousand customers that we serviced every month for urological supplies. And so, did did pretty good. What was your approach to sales? I mean, people told you you should get into sales. What do you know? What made you a good salesman? Um, I like to talk. I like to listen to. I like to listen also. I like to to, you know, when I go in and do a, I go into an in service with a case, a case manager. You know, some people go in. They they get fifteen minutes to the case manager. And they talk for fourteen minutes. I go in and I try to talk for two minutes. Let her talk for thirteen minutes. Tell me what she needs, and then. You know, I'm sitting here taking notes all the time about what what she needs. And that's one of the, I think one of the better things in a salesperson is don't be talking all the time. Don't be telling what you can do. You know, tell what you do for them, but find out what they 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 need because because most of them already have somebody they're using, and um, I want to be I want to be the person they use. So I want to find out what that the people they're using is are not doing for them, how I can fix a problem for them or I can fix something for them, make their life easier. And so I let them just talk to me and I find out what they need and I make sure I provide what they need. And if I provide what they need over and over, and they send me you know, a couple of customers and I do a good job for them and I follow up with them. I let them know, you know how things went with this customer and they're on service with us now, we'll provide for every month. You won't have to bother, they'll, they'll never be calling you, bothering you at all. And they send more to us. and um, Doing that is one way. And then another way I did, like I said, I knew a, a lot of people that were in, in chairs. So I, I called a lot of them and I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm in the medical supply business now. I know you need catheters. Uh, I'm your man. And um, so a lot of times I do that. And so did you come to it naturally, that, that sales approach? Or did you have to learn that approach? How did you, how did you um, come to it? It came kind of natural to me, Chris. I kind of got, um, yeah, I was just just able to talk to people, listen to people. Was something I was, uh, I was pretty good at. Uh, I don't know if it was from, from pre-injury, being at places and you know trying to ask ask girls out on dates or or, or picking up somebody at the bar. I don't know. You know, I I, I was always a good talker. Uh, I had this, well, my, my best friend's guy named Joe Santoro and, and Joe, Joe was good looking as he could be. He, 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 he could attract girls all night long, but he couldn't talk to them with the darn. So I'd go out with Joe and Joe would attract the girls. They'd come over just wanting, wanting Joe, but Joe couldn't, couldn't talk at all. So I would, I would always close the deal. I, I could talk, I could talk whatever I needed to say. I could talk to him. 
And so I'd close, Joe would attract him and I'd close the deal. So between the two of us, we made a good, a good, good pair and a good couple. And uh, so uh, I, I guess that was kind of the start of my, my sales experience right there. <laughs> Well, that that led all the way. I mean, this is this is an interesting parallel, right? Your your professional sales experience with with your uh, you know with your dating experience, and yes. but it but it came to a head. How did you propose to your wife, Joy? Okay, well, how I met her in the first place was well, this um, is, okay. Okay, she was working in a rehab a rehab institute in Kansas City. It's called it's called rehab, rehab Institute of Kansas City, and uh. I was open in the Kansas, Missouri territory, and uh, it was right on the line. And I called out there, and I'd been a rec therapist before. So being a rec therapist, I knew that when I was a rec therapist, I knew people out in the community, the route going, in chairs, would be good for sales. So and I wanted to hire somebody in a wheelchair. Like I say, all my sales reps were, were folks in wheelchairs. And so I called the rehab there and asked for recreation therapy and got a girl on the phone named Joy. Excuse me. And I told Joy what I needed and we talked for a long time. And I, you know, she was, we talked a couple of times. She's real sweet on the phone. She sounded cute. And I thought, Hey, you know, while I'm out there, I appreciate all your help. Why don't we go to dinner? Her in the line, she's thinking expense account, free dinner. Why not? And so I remember I rolled in her office and, and there's a young lady sitting in the corner of the office. And, um, and she was sitting there and I said, I said, Joy. And she turned and, and it was her and she turned around. And I said to myself, right there, I said, I'm going to marry this girl. Like I said, I said to myself, I didn't say I left. And, um, and we went out that first night and hit it off great. We stayed up at like three in the morning talking. Next night, she had a date with somebody else. She broke it. We went out again. The next two days, I was supposed to go to St. Louis for some interviews. So I found some more things doing Kansas City. And uh, so we, she and I went out uh, a couple more times there. And then uh, that was in the, the day I met her was August 7th of 1995. And we dated long distance till you know, back and forth. We saw each other every two or three weeks. Uh, either I'd fly to Kansas City and see her, she'd fly to Atlanta and see me, or I'd go to a race and, and she'd fly to the race and meet me and, and up to Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, or we, you know, wherever the races were. And uh, she'd come see me race. And then um, on Christmas Eve, uh, it's when we got engaged. And I'll tell you how I got engaged. It was kind of, it was, it was a, kind of a good engagement um saying knowing knowing i grew up in, in orlando i was living here in atlanta on on new year's day day before new year's day so the january 30th we drove down to orlando and the 31st new year's day uh new year's eve day uh we went and did disney world she never gone to disney world so we did disney world all day long had a great time that night we had dinner at cinderella's castle and i i obviously i planned all this way ahead of time and uh, Cinderella's only worked during the day, but I talked to one of them. I, I gave them all my, my sob story, told them how much I needed them. So this one Cinderella said she, she'd do what I needed her to do. And I bought this glass slipper, the little felt finger I put in it. And I talked to the manager and I got there and I talked to the you know, Cinderella girl and told her exact, exactly what I wanted her to do. So I gave all that to the manager and we enjoyed our eating dinner um, before we, we ate dinner and we ate dinner. And there's a whole, you know, it was probably 75 people in the in the restaurant there, full. And um, all of a sudden, Cinderella walks in this dome platter about eight o'clock at night, and the whole restaurant got quiet. And she walked over our table and said, "Miss Wessler, I have a special dessert for you." And she opened the dome platter, and there was a glass slipper. She handed me a glass slipper. I took the ring off it. I, I said, "Joy, you're my princess. Will you be my queen?" And the whole place got quiet. Everybody's just staring. And she started smiling and said, yes. And the whole place applauded for me. And it was awesome. It was a great experience. And uh, so it was, I, I made a, a really big deal of the engagement. And, and uh, if she had said no, I'd have just got it and left. And I never, I never seen her again. <laughs> but uh, I was very fortunate she said yes. And I, I definitely married up. She's a great gal and, and uh, love her to death. I'm imagining you had a pretty good idea that she would say yes, though. I, I figured she would. But you um, never know for sure. You never know for sure. We dated, so we stayed engaged like six months. And then she's originally from Colorado. So we got married out in Colorado and, uh, in June of, of 96. I'd say we're coming up on our 25th wedding anniversary here real soon. 
Well, so congratulations. Yes, it's uh, yes, yes. Congratulations for me to keeping her and congratulations for her for sticking around. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's so we've seen a lot of it. What are you what are you doing now? I mean, we've seen the racing, we've seen we've seen the the you know the sales side of it. What are you doing now? What are you doing for fun? Well, for, and two things. Um we sold your bed back in 2014 and um and I had a five year non-compete. So I just kind of retired for five years and, and just, you know, traveled and had a good time and spent some of the money I made and it was, it was kind of, kind of good. And then, um, so after my five year non-compete was up in, in 2019, I decided to get back into it. And so I started a company called Eurostat, Eurostat Healthcare. And, um, you know, you can find Eurostat on Facebook or wherever our website is, eurostathealthcare.com. And, um, we do the same thing. We do urological supplies and, and provide those to, to folks all over the country. And then for um, Joy and I traveling a lot, I'm not really working full time anymore. I'm kind of working about half time. And, um, and we, so we still travel a good bit with, with COVID right now. We're not traveling as much, but um, we we're, we're still getting some trips in and, um, and I'm for exercise. I, I have a little hand ergometer, which is like a, little thing, a little machine, put it on a table and, and pedal in place. I have that. And, uh, I do that three days a week. I, I do this little punching bag two days a week and the punching bag. And it sounds easy to sit there and punch a bag, but you punch a bag for 30 minutes. You feel like your arm is going to fall off. And, well, um, it, is it a, you said it's a speed bag, though, right? Speed Not bag. the heavy yeah. bag. It's the speed Not bag. Head bag. The speed bag. Yeah. Yeah. And, so it's the and coordination so, too. It's coordination, yeah, and 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 I've just started doing it, like just like about a month ago, and I'm still not really coordinated with it, and it, it pops me in the head every once in a while, kind of bouncing me back, like whoa, okay, you got to get this hands back down a little better, and um, so it's you know it's it's a it's a great workout though, so I'm trying to stay in shape that way, and um, I my my kids are both uh, I never did tell you that we ended up having okay, Joy and I. Um, I didn't touch on that part, but after five years of being married, we decided we won't have kids. We tried the old fashioned way for a while and that wasn't working. And um, so we went through, uh, tried artificial insemination that didn't work. So we went through in vitro fertilization. We put in three embryo and got out two babies in 2001, got boy girl twins. And so now they're, they just turned 19. So they're doing their freshman year over at Auburn University over in Alabama right now. And um, so they're both over there, and uh, it's great. Like I say, my daughter, my daughter is an aviation major. She 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 learns to fly planes. She wants to work for either a big airline one day or work for companies being a a private pilot for American Express or Visa or whatever. And my son is in in business. He's great with numbers, and he probably is going to be an accountant or something like that. So uh, they're they're both. Um, uh, it's a, it's awesome. That's another one thing that my doctor told me. I'd never, when I first got hurt, I asked him if I ever have kids, and he said no, because at that time, you know, pairs and quads didn't really have children. But fortunately, in vitro fertilization came along. It's just a, like a test tube baby. Take some of my sperm, her embryo, and mix them together, make an embryo, make a so my, my sperm, her eggs, make an embryo, and we put in three embryo and get out two babies. And so we we're very, very blessed for sure. That, that is absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> now, you are also telling your story uh, to to a variety of people. You're not just selling selling medical equipment, but nah, nah. what's what's the message that I mean? You've told us to a certain extent, but what's the message, or what what do you want them to take out of it? I guess really. Well, so many times I'm talking to folks on the phone, and there are a lot of guys guys and gals up there in chairs that you know, they, they may not have been as fortunate as I had. They may not, may not, may not be able to get a vehicle or may not be able to get out of their, their house. And, or some of them just don't want to be seen out in a wheelchair or else they, for whatever reason, um, they're staying home too much. And if you just stay home and you're in your little cocoon watching Jerry Springer every day, um, that's not going to lead to a great life. Uh, you're going to end up getting pressure sores, getting UTIs. I mean, you're not going to get strong at all. You're not going to get, not remain independent. You're going to need help. Um, so I, I try to 
talk to my my customers that they that buy that get the urological supplies from us and and not only did I, I first off I used to after I left Shepherd even though I wasn't working there anymore I went down and did peer support all the time so mm-hmm. I'd have a brand new injury that you know I'd go in and talk to him and he he thinks life's over and and um I tell I'd, I'd say you know life's not over it's just different you know you can there's a lot of things you can do do we we want to walk in we all do and hopefully hopefully you'll be able to if you can then everything I say today you can just blow it off you won't have to ever, ever think about it but until you start walking again or if you don't walk again hopefully i can you know give you a little encouragement a little uh education here that can that can help help you get through some of the tougher times easier and so that's what i did that's what i do now still a peer sport and that's what i did that's what i do now on the phone with, with some of my some of our current customers i can tell they're having a bad day and so i'll you know i, I could call and on and off the phone in two minutes and get their catheter order out. But I ask them, you know, how are things going? And, you know, if they sound like things, they sound down, you know, I'll say, it may sound things aren't going real good. What's, what's, what's up? And, you know, and, and I try to get them through their, some of them have some tough times and maybe they're, they've lost all their friends or, or whatever. Everybody, they go with maybe going through a divorce or, or, or whatever. So I try just to talk to them and, and just help them out as much as I can. I'm not just—I'm not here just to sell catheters to them. They can get their catheters anywhere. Um, I'm here to to kind of build a bond and build friendships and and help people in other ways other than just providing catheters. And and I think that's probably the greatest service that you're providing. Is it that- really is? It's more of a. It's not just catheters. Like I say, you can, they can get the catheters from 20 different companies out there, but providing that service and providing the help to them when they need it makes a tremendous difference. Do you talk to them about the travel? You've traveled a lot. One of the things that looking at you traveling a lot, the thing that I wondered about, did you go anywhere that you thought this is going to be really hard? This is going to be super difficult. And it ended up being way better than you thought it was going to be. Rome, Italy. I'm with Rome, you 100. percent Yeah, I mean, it's you can be sitting at a a, a cafe uh, having a coffee, and there's a column next to you that's 2,000 years old, and it's just sitting there, and you're like, "Wow, that's pretty cool." And then you know, you go to the Colosseum, and and we took a guided tour through the Colosseum, and they're showing us where, you know, 2,000 years ago, over that there were the lions chasing these people, and it's just like you're you're watching Gladiator in person, you know? Um, and so I thought that would be very hard. And it was, you know, difficult. I was getting through some of those places. Venice, Italy, and that was very hard. I had a, I had a able-bodied friend that wanted me to see Venice and he would pick my my heavy butt up and carry me over a lot of those, all those little steps of going over the little uh, canals. And he picked me up and put me down. Well, I got down in the, in the gondola, 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 whatever it is, the little boats. I got down in it okay, but getting back out, I needed Thomas's help. And he picked me up and got me out. And um, so, yeah, the, but I, I try not to miss anything. And I've been in places before where they've carried me up 20 or 30 stairs. And um, um, you just have to try to educate people on how they can do it without hurting themselves. You don't want them to hurt themselves, but also not hurt you. Um, if you if you're getting somebody to help you, I remember I did some videos one time on, on passive aggressive and assertive behavior. You don't want to be passive. If you need help, you don't want to be passive because they start grabbing your chair wrong or grabbing you wrong, and, and they'll hurt themselves, or hurt you. You don't want to be aggressive. You don't want to be a jerk, uh, but to be assertive. If they want to help you, say sure. This is what you got to do. No, no, grab there, grab right over here. If you grab that wheel, it's going to spin on you. And so you just got to you know explain exactly what you need and to know your needs. Let them help you, and people get people enjoy helping you. Um, they get a you know a, a good feeling out of it also, and it enables me to to go places I wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. So yeah, traveling is and especially I've traveled all around Europe, and you know, getting on and off the trains is, is easy, and um, you know different hotels over there some are some are better than others, and um, you know 
Am I going to backpack around Europe? No. Yeah. Would I have done that when I was walking? Maybe so. But uh, there's still tons of places you can go. There's there's all kinds of places around the United States you can go. And uh, But if you want to go overseas, there's plenty of things to do overseas. I, I love Australia. Uh, after my last, after my 2000 Paralympics, we stuck, my wife and I, Joy and I stayed there for two weeks and just traveled up the East Coast and uh, went all the way up to um, Cairns and ended up, we both scuba dive. And uh, so we went and dove the Great Barrier Reef and had a great time doing that. So, Sometimes it's, it's when you compete, it's a matter of, you know, where you want to return, right? Exactly. It's like you're so consumed in the moment of this is, this is the job, this is what I have to do, but you know where you want to return. And it sounds like you had already decided that before you went to Australia. But I also think it's funny that Rome would have been my pick as well for me. I actually went to Rome uh, after I went home after Athens and then turned around and went back to Rome. I went to Rome and Florence and, and Rome is someplace I, I, I think I took two, I was there for a week. I think I took two taxis. Yeah. It just Great. push just around. Push around. And, push around. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and doing Athens in 2004, we did Rome in 2005, you know, on Italy in 2005, we did, did Venice at first. No, we did, um, did Venice first, then Rome, I'm not sure, and in the Tuscany region. And so doing Athens, Greece in 2004, and Rome, Italy in 2005, like you just, I just saw like two of the oldest cities in the world back to back years. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool yeah. to be able to do that and be able to experience that. So it was, it was awesome. Well, hopefully we can get back to traveling a bit. Is there anything that's on your list right now? We have a, a Burns a Burns family travel list, and there's a there's a there's a bunch of places we got to go where we take the kids and stuff, and uh, uh, we'll go to New Zealand and, and Australia, take them there. And uh, I've been to Australia three times, and I've never gone to New Zealand. I, I, I don't know why I didn't when I was over there, but that that close to it. But um, Joy and I actually last year, last summer, were able to go to Tahiti. And if anybody ever, I mean, it, it's expensive, but it's definitely a bucket list. And we stayed in one of those little, little, little huts out over the water. And that was a, that's been my, one of my best um, travel experiences as far as, 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 a, as a couple travel experience. And it was just, it was awesome. And um, so that was kind of cool. And we had to take, you know, four or five different COVID tests to get in and three or four to get back home. But it, it was it, it was worth it at the time for sure. All right. Well, Bert, thank you for joining us on the name tags chat. For the, uh, yeah, I mean, just thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I really appreciate you asking, Chris. And I, I, I hope hope some things I say can help some folks out there and and uh it's 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 been great being on your on your show. <laughs> well, I think you I think you've helped a lot of people out there. And this, for people who missed or only got to see part of it, it will live on the One Revolution page on Facebook. So you can come back and you can see this. We will also turn it into a podcast that will be published in the places that you watch podcasts. So Spotify and uh, Apple and Google and Pandora and all of that stuff. So we will we will get that out. For those of you, please uh, please subscribe, please like what we're doing, and please come back. And Bert, we'll have to have you on again, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you before long, hopefully. Sounds good, Chris. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Thanks, Bert. Yeah. Bye. bye.